I invite you to hear the word of God as it comes to us from Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 to 26. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm, going, if I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Would you please pray with me? God, we do thank you for your holy and inspired word. We thank you, God, that your word is inspired not just in the writing, but again in the hearing. So God, we ask that you would speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we would hear from you, God, personally, individually, but also corporately as a church, God. And that, God, we would be responsive to you, that we wouldn't just be hearers, but also doers of your word. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're continuing today our series called Better Together that's really all about Christian community, what it is, what God does through it. And, uh, and, and really, throughout this series, we're pushing back against this notion that, that true Christian community... Uh, that is, uh, being connected uh, with Christians in something like a life group, that it's sort of an optional deal, that it's just one part of the church, and maybe it's just for sort of advanced Christians, right? That this is uh, an extracurricular, this is an extra credit sort of activity. We're pushing back against that idea that it's an extra credit deal, or that maybe even it's a remedial deal. Like, that maybe this is for somebody that didn't grow up in the church and didn't have Sunday school through their growing up years. And, and so I call you into my office and I say, um, you know, I, I think it's time to get in a life group because I just don't think you're getting it, right? That this is, not a, this is not an extra credit thing. This is not a remedial thing. As you know, when Jesus forms the church, when Jesus forms the church, he does not form a building and he does not form even an event. He uses the word ecclesia right that word it doesn't mean building it doesn't mean event when he says that he is building his church he he says ecclesia which means gathering right and it might not have the same like ring to it if we say on this rock i will build my gathering but that's what it is it is not a building it is not event it is the gathering of the believers following jesus together and he says that he will build his church, his gathering of believers, upon the confession of Peter that he is the Son of God. He is the Messiah, right? So this gathering of believers will be grounded upon who Jesus is and what he has done in his presence in our midst. And we will live this out together. We will follow Jesus together. Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls it life together under the Word. Now, our focus today is we're walking through this on Christian community, our focus today is on living beyond ourselves. Living beyond ourselves. And, and so really what we're talking about is defeating selfishness in our lives. Defeating selfishness. And, um, you know, here's the thing about, about selfishness. It really is, it, it really is, really is what most robs us in this life. Because there are lots of things that people can take from us. And there are lots of things that this world can take from us. 
but selfishness robs us of our true identity. That is, we are made in the image of God. We are made to reflect the character and the goodness and the glory of God. We are made to be a reflection of the God who, when He comes into this world in Jesus, makes this declaration. The Son of Man, speaking about Himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. And so if we are made in His image, then we are made to reflect His glory. And when we reflect His glory, that is, His humility, His servant heart, when we reflect His glory, then we are actually living into our true identity. We are most fully human when we are living as Jesus lived. Amen? So, um, here's where this intersects with Christian community. Here's where it intersects. That is, um, we don't defeat selfishness by ourselves. We don't defeat selfishness by ourselves. If we are truly going to live lives beyond ourselves, if we are really going to fulfill the call of Jesus to love God with everything that we are and to love one another as He loves us, then Friends, we've got to have someone to one another with, right? And I know I just made that into a verb, but it's fair game, right? We, we are going to need someone to one another with. As hard as Christian community can be, to live in true, deep relationships, walking with Jesus, as difficult as that can be, as much as we can frustrate one another, as much as we can annoy one another, even hurt one another, as much as true Christian community requires an investment of time, an investment of energy, an investment of self, we cannot overcome this great enemy to our souls, this selfishness by ourselves. So as we're looking into our scripture today, what we're looking for is how is it that Christian community enables us to do that? Life together under the word enables us to live beyond ourselves because because. We're given three things. We're given three amazing things. First of all, we find that we're given a bigger ambition. We're given a bigger ambition. We're given, secondly, a greater life. And we're given, finally, third, we're given, we're given a better future. Now, the thing about us defeating selfishness, if you think about it, if we're actually going to defeat selfishness, then we have to be given something that is greater than we can produce. Because if we can produce what is greater within ourselves by looking after ourselves, our own need, what we want, if we can produce something that is greater, we will go on being selfish. But if there is something outside of ourselves that can be given to us that is greater than what we can do for ourselves, then, then we begin living beyond ourselves. So here's what's going on. Let's, let's first of all look at this bigger ambition that we are given as we do life together under the Word, a bigger ambition. Now, uh, there's some debate about where Paul is at this point in prison, but it's almost, it's almost completely uh, agreed that the most likely place is Rome. It's almost certainly Rome. So he's in Rome, and here's what's going on. There are those in the Roman church who love Paul, and they're supportive of him, and they're encouraging him as he's in prison for Jesus Christ. But then there are others who are jealous of Paul, who are envious of him, they're envious because of the impact that Paul has had in this world. God has used him so powerfully. He's founded so many churches. He's had such an impact. And they're envious of that. They're envious of his notoriety. And so they're preaching the gospel. They're preaching that Jesus came into this world. The Son of God made flesh and he died for us to give us life. They're preaching the true gospel. But they're finding some ways, right? They're pretty sly about it. They're finding some ways to kind of slip in some criticism. They're, they're, they're undermining Paul whenever they get a chance. And so their purpose is not just to proclaim the gospel, but actually to tear Paul down. He says that they preach out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. And what amazes me about Paul is that this is his response. You ready? But what does it matter? But what does it matter? The important thing, listen, do you hear his bigger ambition? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, that Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. And you know, I'm trying to put myself in Paul's shoes, right? You want to try to do that this morning. Just imagine this. 
Imagine what you have been through for the cause of Christ. That you have been beaten and left for dead. That you have nearly frozen to death and nearly starved to death. That you are under constant threat and all of it for Jesus. And you are presently sitting in a cell facing an uncertain future for the sake of the gospel of Jesus. And your brothers in the church are undermining you and they're criticizing you and they're coming against you. What would you feel like? I'm going to tell you, I would be angry. And even more than angry, I would be hurt. Wouldn't you be wounded by this? And surely Paul was both of those things. He's a human being. But Paul is able to get to the place where he can say, you know what? They're speaking against me. They're against me. They're criticizing. They're trying to undermine me. They're trying to do me harm. But what does it matter? What does my reputation matter? What does my ego matter? What does my pride matter? What does it matter whether they're criticizing me or not? Christ is being preached, and that's the only thing that matters. He has found a higher ambition, a bigger ambition than himself. And so, here's the thing about this bigger ambition. He knows that his critics cannot destroy it. Because Christ will be glorified through him. No matter what may come, they cannot take this bigger ambition away from him. And what he's saying to them, what he's saying to them, is that they have loved him into and prayed him into this faith and this passion for Christ. This is what he says. He says, I know that through your prayers, your prayers, the prayers of the community around him, through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, God working in him, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Now when you first hear that, you you think what Paul is saying is, I know that you're praying for me and I know that your prayers are going to get me out of prison. But actually, this word deliverance, this word deliverance is the word for salvation. So what Paul's saying here is not, I know your prayers are going to get me out of prison. What he's saying is not, you know what, your prayers are going to get me saved because I haven't come to saving knowledge in Jesus. He's not saying that. He's talking about the grand sweep of God's salvation. He is saying that I know that all of this is going to work together for good. I know that God is working all of this together to glorify the name of Christ. And so his bigger ambition is, is not defeated is not defeated and and here's the thing Paul has such passion for Jesus Christ and what I know about this passion for Jesus Christ is that we cannot generate this passion for Jesus in us by ourselves we need one another and what I know is that we cannot maintain this level of passion for Jesus that he would be our bigger ambition by ourselves You know, it's a little bit like barbecuing. And I know that you're going to think if you've been around here a while, man, this guy compares spiritual things to food a lot, right? (laughs) And that's true, and that's true. But but Jesus sort of did that too, so I I think I'm okay. It's kind of like barbecuing. Um, Just a quick survey, just out of curiosity. Um, If you're a a barbecuer, um, how, how how many do charcoal as opposed to propane? Okay, there are like four of us in the room. So the rest of you all, this is going to be mysterious. But, but still go with me, right? I, I'm going I'm to convince you of the value of charcoal. Amen? All right, so, <laughs> so I started out barbecuing with charcoal where I would put the coals in these little pyramids, right? Put them in this little pyramid, and either you had to have the, the, the lighter fluid already in those little briquette guys, or you had to pour it on them, and you would light them, and they'd kind of warm up over time. But then I made this discovery, right? It's, it's called the chimney starter. <laughs> this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. It, it's, it's this tube thing with vents, and, and you stick some newspaper underneath it. You pour those briquettes in. I'm going somewhere. Hang with me, right? And, and you light that paper, and they are hot in a fraction of the time, right? And it's all about two things. It's about proximity of those little briquettes to each other, and it's about airflow. It's about proximity and airflow. And so you get them in there, and you get that fire started, and the air is pumping through, and they're right next to each other, right? They're right next to each other, and, and it, it takes no time at all, and they are red hot. And here, here, let me make this comparison now. If we are those little briquettes, 
And that chimney starter is Christian community. And that airflow is the Holy Spirit blowing through a place. Then we heat one another up to red hot for Jesus Christ. So in this life together, friends, we find, we find a bigger ambition for our lives. Bigger than just ourselves. That is to glorify Christ. Secondly, we find, a, we find a greater life. You know, Paul is not entirely sure about what's going to happen to him. You can tell that from his writing. He doesn't know whether this imprisonment is going to end in his acquittal or in his death. But he does know, he does know that if he goes on living... He will be living for Jesus Christ. He says, he says, to live is Christ. Jesus is his life. And so if he goes on living, his will be a poured out life, a life that is poured out for others. He says, I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. For your progress. That's his point in life. If I go on living, the point of my life will be for your progress in the faith and your joy in the faith. And I want to just ask you now, what it would be like if every one of us in this church saw this as our purpose in life. That my purpose in life is to be here for your progress in the faith and your finding joy as you follow Jesus. What if that was my purpose? The reason I am here is to advance your walk with Jesus and to help you find joy in Him. And what if your ambition, what if your purpose were to help me advance in my walk with Christ and to help me to experience joy in the Lord? What if that were true? What could God do through such a church? You're helping me press forward in faith, and I'm helping you press forward in faith. Friends, the Spirit of the Lord is already in this place. The Spirit of the Lord is already in this church. This church is already a welcoming, loving, kind, encouraging, generous church. But imagine if we got this close. Imagine if we got this passionate. Imagine what God would do. I tell you that darkness would tremble before this church. I tell you that God would be blessed and the gospel of Jesus Christ would be advanced powerfully in this community. That's what would happen. You know, I find it so interesting that Jesus does not say in discussion of human greatness, you know, if you want to be great, you're really sinning. You need to stop wanting to be great. He doesn't ever say that. In fact, in discussion of human greatness, He encourages our greatness. He just tells us, listen, I want you to be great, but you're just working against your own greatness by your selfishness. This is what he says. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. He says, I want you to be great. You were made for greatness. Don't squander the greatness for which you are made by misunderstanding how you accomplish greatness. We are made, friends, for greater lives. Now finally, as we live together under the Word, what we find, what we are given, is knowledge of a better future. We are given a better future. You know, Paul can give himself away, and he can give himself away so radically because he knows that he has been given everything. He already has everything. He needs nothing. He can give himself away and give himself away radically because he has been given everything. He says to live is Christ and to die is gain. And you can't say something like that unless you have discovered that what is truly life is in Jesus, following him, loving him, walking with him daily. He's discovered that. And you can't say something like to die is gain unless you understand, unless by divine revelation you have come to understand that when you die, you are going into something that is better. That is, Paul knows when he dies, he will have more of Christ. The Christ that he knows now in part through the revelation of the Spirit to his heart that he sees now in a mirror dimly, then he knows he will see face to face. And so he says, for me, to die is gain. And he has this, you know, he has this kind of debate. I don't know which one I would choose. I don't know which one's better. He says, 
I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. And friends, he's not saying that because he has anything to say about it. He's not saying this because he's going to determine whether he lives or dies. He is saying this, he is sharing this to encourage the Christian community to speak life and hope and courage into them. That no matter what happens, no matter what happens, ultimately, we have a better future in Jesus Christ. You know, um, this Bible, this Bible belonged uh, to a good friend of mine uh, who's gone, he's departed to be with Christ. Um, this is Bible. Uh, one day, uh, this was 10 years or so ago, he walked into my office um, and, and he said, uh, he said, Jeremy, um, the church needs to be reading the Bible. And, uh, and I'm a pastor, I guess you know that, um, but you know, that's not the sort of thing that you can form an argument against when you're a pastor. You just, you just can't said, the church needs to be reading the Bible. And that was the beginning for me of the journey through the Bible. And I can't tell you what these past 10 years of walking daily with the Lord in His Word have meant to me. And uh, as a part of that, um, he, he was actually a part of starting a, a men's small group that walked through the Bible together. And I still remember that group, right? And and we were meeting at the time, just a real small group, four or five of us, we were meeting at a Brugger's Bagel at the time. And, and we're sitting around this table, I can still see the table in my mind, and we were there early on a Tuesday morning. We are talking about this scripture in Acts. It, it's it's the, the death of Stephen, who's the first Christian martyr. So we're reading from the book of Acts, and the thing that catches our attention is that when, when Stephen's being stoned to death, when he's in that time of transition, that... He sees heaven open. Jesus opens heaven to him, and Jesus stands up and comes to him. He says, this is Acts 7.56. Stephen says, look, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And we talked about how in other scriptures, the risen and glorified Christ, he's always seated, right? He's always seated on, at the right hand. Seated. Why? Because he's completed the work of salvation on the cross. He's seated. The work is done. And yet here, he's standing. And we talked about how Jesus is here fulfilling his word in the Gospel of John 14, where he says, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And we talked about how amazing this promise of God is, this promise that Jesus will welcome us home. We talked about how amazing that promise is. That was Tuesday morning. On Thursday, my friend and brother Don Hill went to set up for VBS at the church, right? He helped all morning at VBS. And that Thursday afternoon, he went home, and he took a nap, and he woke up in heaven. And, and you can try to tell me that it's a coincidence that we had that discussion from God's Word in Christian community on that Tuesday, and on Thursday, he went to heaven. You can tell me that that is a coincidence, but you will never convince me. I am convinced that God was revealing our better future to that little Christian community and doing it just the right time to prepare us for the loss of our brother. So that when we thought of his loss, we would know that heaven was open and that Jesus stood up and he welcomed him home to his better future. And so may we be found in Christ as we live together under his word. As we give, give ourselves away, give ourselves for one another to this bigger ambition, this greater life, knowing that we have, friends, a better future. I'd like to ask you if you would please pray with me. God, we do thank you and we give you praise that there is something greater, something outside of ourselves, something we could not do for ourselves that has been given to us. That the gospel, that the good news is that Jesus has given us everything. And so, God, because we have everything, we ask that you remind us, you enable us to give ourselves away, to have a, a higher ambition, a, a bigger ambition for our lives, that our ambition would be to glorify Christ and to make Christ known. God, we do ask, humbly but boldly ask, for a greater life, God. We know that you made us for greatness. Show us, God, convince us that greatness is found in giving ourselves away. And God, 
remind us, remind us always of our better future, that we've been given everything in you, everything. Free us up then, God, to give ourselves away. In Jesus' name we pray all of this. Amen. I want to share with you a, a brief testimony, some of the stuff that God's up to in our life groups. Let's go ahead and show that now. I'm Kathy Green, and I did the life group training this past summer and felt very called to lead a group. And I co-lead a group with Pat Becker, and we have an amazing group of women. We come together every Thursday. We look forward to the, to the group. Um, we feel uplifted when we leave the group. And it's just wonderful to see how the Lord is working in each one of our lives. We discuss the scriptures that we've read. Many times during the week, we find that we have, you know, really hit upon one scripture that spoke to everybody, um, and we really get into to wonderful discussions about how that scripture worked in each of our lives. And we're also a group of women who look after each other. Um, we keep up with, with what's going on in our lives especially when there's illnesses and hospitalizations and we keep each other in prayer all the time. But it's been a wonderful experience. It was, you know, it was a calling that I just felt really passionate about and I'm so glad that decided to, to lead a group of women and it has just been a life-changing experience for all of us. So we've come together and, and we share and we all love the Lord and we love each other.